Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. This is my console, and the spotlight is Dan Conover, author of seven novels, including such titles as Another Goddamn Novel About the Collapsing Quantum Multiverse and The Goddess Daughter Trilogy, among others. He's also a Tar Heel. He hails from Greensboro, North Carolina, a lovely town that I've been to. Having lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm quite familiar with uh, the Tar Heel State. Uh, as it isn't called actually statewide, but uh, he also graduated from the University of North Carolina, further immersing himself in Tar Heel culture. He's a former tank commander in the U.S. military. He has a piece of shrapnel in his left earlobe to this day that serves as you know a piercing and a, an ornament on holidays. In addition to that, I mean, on a more peaceful front, he's a former reporter and bureau chief with various newspapers, news organizations, you name it. In 2008, After working as a freelancer and media consultant for several years, he launched a media services company named Arctopia LLC. He did that along with his wife, Jana Edens, who is also a writer and a graphic designer. Uh, The list of activities and accomplishments uh, in Dan Conover's bio goes on. Uh, We haven't even gotten into his wife's ancestral farm in South Carolina, uh, now operating under the moniker Black Sheep Manor Gardens. You know, that black sheep part sounds like Eric Prince has a stake in it, but then Manor Gardens sounds so pastoral. This man is a bundle of contradictions, as as you'll learn as we go along here. Dan Conover, patriot, insurgent, gentleman farmer, and now full-time novelist. Welcome to the program. Mike, thanks for having me on the show. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And, uh, yeah, having looked at your website, having read your bio, having looked at at sampled your various novels, uh, I was really interested in and in getting into some depth here with you. Let's start, though, with kind of the some of the things that may have set the table for your writing career. You were a tank commander. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that you were in charge of a single tank yes. or a battalion or a company <laughs> no. or what? No, I was a sergeant. Um, I made um, sergeant in the um, second armored cavalry uh, while I was in Germany. But I did, actually, the rank didn't catch up to me till I, I got to Texas for my second um, stint and they're like wait a minute why are you wearing the wrong rank i'm like well nobody told me but i had been um as it worked out um we just were short sergeants uh, in germany and so my first stint as a tank commander was while before i made sergeant uh which is not supposed to happen but we just ran out of people that could read a map um and and run a tank so how many guys are in a tank four is it Abrams? Were uh, you an Abrams yeah, tank? Yeah, on the original Abrams tank. And then I was on the, the second Abrams tank as a gunner with the big the big 120 millimeter gun, which is uh, makes a big bang. I have uh, bad yes. hearing. I mean, I've, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, I've, I haven't heard it live, but I've uh, definitely yeah, heard it uh, recorded and so on. It's a rush. Um, you know, uh, you don't. You may or may not be a, a militaristic guy. I know that you use the GI Bill. Did, was was this part of a plan that you go to the military, serve your country, and in return you get that GI Bill? You got your college education. Was that all part of the plan, or were you kind of a gung ho, uh, go U.S. Are you at my country, right or wrong sort um, of guy back in when you were a youngster? No, no, I don't think I've ever been that person. Um, I was. You know, I basically went to college on the GI Bill, excuse me, on the uh, Pell Grant originally at App State. And um, that was great. I had a fantastic education there until they cut the federal Pell Grant program. And um, there was just no way that I could I could go to college. So, um, you know, I wound up. Uh, see, I dropped out in December and I was in the Army in October. Okay. And how many years did you do four or four six years, or eight? Four years. Four years in, in okay. And uh, so we, you, the big heavy equipment and all that. <laughs> Does your military experience, I mean, we draw from so many things right. when we're writers. Does your military experience inform your writing at all? 
I think everything we ever do does. So yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the in the this fourth book in this this series called the Darbus Cycle, um, which is constructed of trilogies. So this starts the second trilogy after the Goddess Daughter. Uh, one of the characters is a career army sergeant. So um, you know the the way that I know that um, that I'm getting him right is that he's saying things that army sergeants that I know would say. And if I try to make him say something that they wouldn't say, he tells me. He rebels. Yes, he does. He tells you, give me 20. <laughs> I would not. <laughs> I'm not saying that, dude. Um, okay, God, what would you say? Okay, fine, go. Because it really is sort of like, um, it, it really is sort of like running a theater company in your head. And, um, and they are supposed to, they are supposed to speak, but sometimes they rebel against the lines that you're writing for. A theater company. So let me ask you, have you ever been writing a novel and said, you know, I got too many characters. There's, I, this is going to be too chaotic. It's going to be too hard to keep track of them. And I'm going to confuse the reader. Has that happened? Or are you the guy, kind of guy who tends to keep clean lines, min- minimum characters, clean lines with a really strong author- authorial voice? What would you say? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. Um, I will say this, that the... Um um, you know, basically, you have your protagonist, antagonist. You have your important characters that drive the plot, um, and then you have people that are essentially just sort of part of the. They're either part of the plot or somebody that would be in the scene if if you were staging the scene. I, I don't think that I have too many characters. What I think is that when you are plotting out a book or, or a, a series of books. That is supposed to be, you know, 14 or excuse me, 15 books. Um, you have to keep track of everything, uh, including characters and their names and their birth dates and all kinds of ridiculous trivia. Um, so that's a big part of the process. It's just not the fun part. Because these are characters who you're using uh, on a continuing basis. I mean, uh, would you say, uh, let's take a guy like Carl Hyacin out of Florida. He uh, brings back characters, especially that crazy former governor. I forget his name, but you know, I'm talking oh, about absolutely. the guy with the, fa- yes. with the fake eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a glass eye and all that. So, um, but then on the other hand, you, you have all kinds of different writers who, that, that this is my detective and I, that detective, Travis McGee is in John D. McDonald's novels, almost all of them. So is it that sort of thing? Or do you have more of an ensemble of characters? This is an ensemble cast. And, and so you've already plotted, you've got seven novels and you plotted, but, but you mentioned 15. So you're plotted out for 15. Yeah. So, so basically I've, I've just now finished the fourth of the, actually, let me step back for a second. So what originally happened was that I wrote up the first book that I ever wrote was out of this world, this Darbus continent world. And, um, I thought it was pretty good. It was, a um, a near miss story in terms of it being published by a, an actual publishing house. And uh, then I just had to go back to being a, a newspaper editor and reporter. Um, and I didn't get to do much with that f- until years later. And, you know, I thought, I really kind of like this world. I, I, I think there's stuff I could do in that. I'm going to write a prequel. And so what I've done is I've taken... That first book that I, I wrote, which I later broke into two and submitted uh, again years later, um, trying to get a, an agent. Um, you know, I've taken those. I, those were things that I published as ebooks. I've pulled them back, and they're going to be um, basically written through. They'll be the third trilogy in this series. Um, so, <laughs> you know, basically, I'm giving myself the time to develop that story in that world. Um, in a generation before that book, before that that third trilogy, which is so been these a lot are of trilogies, uh, trilogies within a a bigger body of work, right? And and so, in terms of what that means from a structural point, from a um, a planning point, is that every book has to have its own book arc. It also has to have its trilogy arc, and then it has to have a series arc. And so keeping all of You don't that, make things easy for yourself. Um, you you know, know, I don't. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> I don't. I could make it a lot easier. Um, but this one, um, 
it, it sort of took over. Well, let me ask you this. So you've got this ensemble of characters and I can see to where they become very intimate to you and uh, you, you know them very well. Your, your, uh, their lives, the personalities continue to unfold. Experiences are there, but do you, does that fire you up or does that, do you get to a point or have you ever had even a passing thought that, you know, I'm getting sick of these people. I'd like to just go and create a whole new uh, a whole new ensemble of, of folks. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Um, I, I can tell you that that I had an absolute blast writing the first uh, this this Goddess Daughter trilogy. Um, as probably, I mean, I enjoy writing books in the first place, so that's that's not an issue. But once I found the thread, um, that was just I, I really like these people, and I think that that's a that's generally a good, um, a good marker for how the readers will find them. If, if you're having fun with the characters and they seem real to you, I think that's probably a pretty good indicator. I'm not bored with any of them. And in fact, I'm just the, 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 the only issue I've got right now is just waiting on right now. I'm waiting on my editor who's, um, really been, who's taken off and gotten more clients. And so all of a sudden, I'm having to wait on her. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, it happens. Uh, so let me ask you about what uh, does inform your writing most. The, the military, ha- you know, has its place. It's a, like like anything else that happens in life. Uh, you're not going to write the next Catch-22. That's not what you're interested in. No major, major in your book. <laughs> but uh, what about um, other influences you've oh, had absolutely. in your life? Is there anything that really stands out? Well, it's absolutely... That, that, that's been number one. Um, I mean, being a being a newspaper man for twenty years, um, boy, that's a world, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And, and you know the um, absolutely <sighs> strikes me that once you've being in being a newspaper man, and I, I use that in, rather than just journalist used to mean that you had access to all parts, all sorts of parts of life that most people don't get to ever really get close to. They might get close to one thing, but I mean, I was a city editor for a long time. And so even when um, it wasn't my reporting that I was doing, I was working with 37 reporters and editors, um, all, all of whom were working on stories. And I had to be embedded mentally in everything they were doing. Uh, because that's what my job was making decisions about those things. It's, it's this incredible education if you're lucky enough to get it. And I don't know that, I, I mean, you know, I haven't been in the business now for quite a while, so I'm not sure what it's like now. But back then, it was the best training that a writer could ever get <laughs> because you're writing or editing every single day, hours and hours. So you're getting in your 10,000 hours really fast but but it's a different kind of writing oh it is but it is um but i I mean i've always enjoyed writing fiction i wrote fiction before i became um a newspaper guy um honestly you know i figured coming out of college that or you know when i had to drop out of college the first time i just i just figured i'd go back and get a degree in english because all i ever really wanted to do was write and i thought that's just what you did um, but being in the army made me realize, uh, you know, I was a, I was just one of the jobs I had in Germany. I was what was called a border operator, and we patrolled the Czech and East German borders. I, that was really fun. Uh, I loved doing it, um, and so I wound up having that as um, part of my job was running these uh, patrols on the border. And by the time I came back from that experience. Uh, with the pressures and the deadlines and the just kind of the, the excitement of going out and looking at things like this. Um, I just couldn't see myself just being in a, a university setting for the rest of my life. So were you writing, were you writing when you were in the military? I was. Did you, you did have time and you were drawing off of, uh, yeah. Okay. So interesting. So I will say that when it comes to newspaper writing, I think the handicap it creates in people writing fiction, you had an advantage in that you were writing fiction before you were doing the newspaper stuff. But I, 
I find myself that it tends to create situations where I'm inclined to over explain things oh, yeah. and to be overly structured. And it's kind of like, you know, when you're writing fiction, you need to leave some breathing room for the reader. You need to let them fill in some blanks. You need to let them sketch out uh, some of the, you know, whether the physicality of the people or the or the uh, the landscape or the the uh, the urban settings and, mm-hmm. and and whatnot. So I find that uh, I tend to over describe and also just feel like I've got to fill everything out. And it's like you don't need to do that. Well, that's I mean, where editing comes in, Mike. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, where you but edit it also, yourself. But it also kind of well, you want to do a good first draft. Or, well, not necessarily a first draft, but you want to do a do do a good uh, uh, finished draft anyway. And uh, uh, it takes some of the joy out of writing fiction. It almost defeats the purpose because a lot of people who are in in the writing business go to fiction thinking it's there's freedom there. And unless you allow that freedom to actually assert itself, then it's kind of like defeats the purpose. Let me ask you this. Well, let me just, let me, I'm, right- I'm going to jump in real quick. Sure. You brought up Kyle Hy- Carl Hyacinth before. Newspaper yeah. guy. Another newspaper yes. guy. SV Date. Another Florida newspaper guy. What do they have in common? Well, they've got this very tuned ear for humor and absurdity and they uh they came out of that florida realm where i mean florida is just a you know a strange place and <laughs> you know so i think that it's i i think that it can be and i know s- several newspaper people who who i think are are really good at writing fiction um but but i but to your point i absolutely um particularly in this book that i just finished found myself going back on that first draft and going okay you d- this this we're not going to grade this for for accuracy and, and the completeness of everything we're going to cut that down and that's where you know um you know I, self-editing self-editing is is i you know my favorite part of of writing by the way is when i've got that first draft done and now i get to do my first read and i get to i get to write through the whole story instead of constructing it. How much editing do you do as you write? Because that's that's one of the real Achilles tendons of writers is that they don't allow themselves to really just let it flow. They just they judge every word, phrase, and sentence. So I try to keep the flow as a as the primary focus in, in that I understand when I'm writing that first draft that I'm, I'm building the story that I'm then going to have the freedom to work with. The only time that I really stop moving forward and go back and fix something is when it won't let me sleep at night. Right? I, I know that I can always come back at the end and do it, but in some instances, it's just so irritating to me that I missed that beat. Or um, I just need to go back and fix it, and I'll do that. Uh, but generally, you get to the end. That's when the um, some of the best writing takes place is when you've got a complete story, and now it's like, well, what did I miss while I was pushing forward? You know, when I read your writing, I'm reminded of one of my favorite novelists, former newspaper man, in fact, Tom Robbins. <laughs> As in another roadside yeah, attraction yeah, and half too. asleep in frog pajamas yeah. and so on. Uh, is he counted among your influences? Uh, you know, he's from Blowing Rock, of all places. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, was, Blow, Blowing Rock, North Carolina, for you listeners who are not familiar with the geography there. Right. Um, and I, of course, it was at App State and Boone, which is, we all, this is back when you couldn't get beer in Boone back in the 80s. So we all would go up to Blowing Rock for, for a beer. But uh, yeah, I absolutely loved Robbins when I was, uh, when I was a, college student um and you know I, I, one it, of the things that i saw i see was, i see it in your writing because it's your writing is really flamboyant and energetic and that's the way tom robin that, that those are just two of the characteristics but certainly he's he's known for his flamboyance he's known for energetic writing you know, and wild characters wild characters and you know the so the the one book where i felt like i got to um indulge that that robin's energy was the book that I wound up calling another goddamn novel about the collapse in quantum multiverse, um, because it was, I just finished this big contract, um, as a consultant and best money I'd ever made. And, um, I did two things with that other than pay the bills and pay some kids college tuitions. 
um, I bought my wife and I some camping equipment. And then the second thing that I did was I said, I'm going to take a month and I'm going to write, I'm going to write a book that I'll never have to worry about publishing. I'm just going to have fun doing it. And that was that I, it's, it, I broke every rule of fiction writing that I could think of in writing that book. And, um, and a few years, and this is a multiverse one. Yes. And, um, and I had so much fun doing that. <laughs> um, I, and you did publish it. So, I so it actually it, worked yeah. for, but you, I never submitted it to an agent. I never considered submitting it to an agent. Did you, did you think that a no agent will accept it because it's too out there? Yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, I, re- I'm, I'm somebody to be clear about it. I really wanted <laughs> that traditional publishing experience mm-hmm. and, um, didn't we all do didn't want to let it go and um and i don't want to talk bad about it because that's you know i'm entirely aware that that could just be very sour grapey on my part but um but i also understand that that uh, the industry's in flux i've talked to people who you know i've you know had friends that were published novelists and um um you know heard from from them the kinds of issues that they had. So right now I see that there's a path for doing the thing that I want to do, which is just doing this and having it pay for itself um, through doing this independent route. So I'm doing that. Um, And so far so good, but um, you know, it's, um, it means that I have to do things that I don't like doing like um, promoting and, and, you know, getting good at advertising, but Mm -hmm. it also means that I get to call the shots. Right. It's pretty good. And the residuals are bigger. That's correct. Uh, I don't know. Unless you're, unless you're a big time, uh, unless you sell really big numbers, uh, traditional publishing companies give you uh, a very thin slice of the pie. I, I, I can't prove this, but from what I have gathered, I would wager that if there aren't more people who are actually making a living self-publishing right now than people who are being published the traditional route, that that day will come soon. Mm, Interesting. Um, So who else influenced your fiction writing? Tom Robbins is one of them. Give mm -hmm. us a few other people who you you really like and you feel like uh, helped to form your own voice. So like one of the things that you hear a lot when you – talk to people who write fantasy and science fiction is a story that goes like this. Oh, I grew up in a traditional home, yada, yada. And then I discovered amazing stories. And it was like this incredible thing. And I love to go read this magazine or I discovered this science fiction writer. And it was like, you know, it's always like this flash in the dark and um, uh, this, this sense of uh, a forbidden pleasure. I've discovered science fiction and fantasy with me. It was the exact opposite because I grew up in a home where there were lots of books and almost all of them, all the adults in my world who read, their primary thing that they read was science fiction, fantasy mixed in there. And so I grew up and I had probably read hundreds of books, the science fiction and fantasy books, uh, by the time I was a, a young teen. And so the thing that really kind of changed me was at some point I stumbled across a really lesser, not very good book by John Steinbeck called The Moon is Down. And for whatever reason, I just got really interested in Steinbeck. And so by the time I was probably 15 or 16, I'd read just about everything he'd ever written. What made him so interesting to you? I mean, I, I know he writes know. beautifully, but he, but it just captured you. Because you don't write anything like Steinbeck. I mean, your writing is is a is a completely different style. Right. I, I, uh, I honestly don't know what it was. I liked his sensibilities. Um, I loved his um, – um, I loved the characters in books like uh, Cannery Row, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, a Tortilla Flat. I, I mean, some of those books are not really well read now. And, and, and he clearly – I was – when I got to college, I was – surprised at how out of fashion Steinbeck was among the, um, the few people that I knew in the, in the literature department. But, um, yeah. but you and, can't go wrong with Steinbeck though. I, I mean, anyway, I, he was formative to me and, and I, he was, so at 14, I knew I wanted to be a writer because I really enjoyed reading Steinbeck. And I read through this standard sort of what used to be the canon of sort of 
uh, mid-century 20th uh, American novelists and, and whatnot. Um, but I also ran into Kerouac when I was about 16. And On the Road was a, mm-hmm, a big thing mm-hmm. to me. Um, kind of. I hear Douglas Adams out there somewhere. Did read, did read Douglas Adams, but not until college. Um, and but I, I'll tell you that the person. So I'd just gotten remarried. I was living in in Charleston with my wife and our four kids, and um, and we lived next door to the library and public library in Charleston, and we'd go there because we didn't have any money, so we'd take the kids to the library, and. Um, I just picked up this book, looked kind of interesting to me, called Flanders by a writer named um, uh, Patricia Anthony, who was a science fiction writer. Um, And Patricia had won, like, I can't remember which, she won some awards for her first book and then a book called Brother Termite. But she was kind of a cult favorite. I, I didn't know anything. I'd never heard of her. And the problem for her was that she wanted to tell stories that didn't fit neatly into boxes. And, um, anyway, I read this book, uh, Flanders, um, which I won't bother to try to describe now other than say it's a book about world war one. It involves, um, a, a, you know, a psychic soldier, um, in the trenches. It made me cry. <laughs> um, and when I was done with it, I'm like, I just love this book. And I did something I never done before. And I just wrote her a letter and she wrote me back and we got to be, I never met her. She lived in Dallas. I was working in Charleston. Um, we talked a lot and she, and because I've really valued that friendship, I, it was, I never leaned on her to help me try to build a career. She was at that point, basically just making her money off of, um, James Cameron kept optioning her, her books. Um, Mm. she was working, she was, I think basically she was just, she was an adjunct at, um, Southern Methodist, I think. But she was the bravest, most um, body, fearless person I think I'd, I'd ever met. She was she refused to do what they wanted her to do in terms of stick within the, the science fiction genre. Um, and eventually her publisher just said, I, we can't be your publisher anymore <laughs> because you're not writing something that that fits into science fiction anymore. Um and so she described herself as being slipstream and slipstream. slipstream. Interesting. And the, the, so I've, I, I decided because of her, I decided that, all right, this, this series, this Darby cycle is fantasy, but it's kind of science fiction. And then it kind if I think it falls by the alleged rules of, of fantasy lit, I think it falls very clearly into the subgenre of, of epic fantasy. It just has different sensibilities and it just kind of goes outside of what people, um, it just doesn't stick to the form in, in, in a way that um, a publisher would be real comfortable with maybe, but Patricia right. would be, I think Patricia would be proud <laughs> that I got here and that's what matters to me. She, she died a few years ago. Um, mm. And, um, yeah, but I could talk about well, you know, it all day. You know, uh, Kerr Bonnegat was always put in science fiction, and he didn't really see himself as science fiction. No. And and uh, ditto for – actually, uh, you could read – when I would read Douglas Adams, it would start out with some science fiction, would end with science fiction, but everything in between was just a regular, hysterically funny yeah. novel with great characters. Yeah. Uh, and I think Ray Bradbury said, you know, I wrote one science fiction book and everybody's called me science fiction ever since. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. I didn't know that. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean. No, that's not an exact quote, but he was just saying, yeah. you know, I, 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 I'm not really science fiction. I write about uh, everything. I, I did one and now everybody's labeled me science fiction. Well, it worked for him. Uh, so no complaint there. It worked for Kurt Vonnegut, worked for Douglas Adams. So um, let me ask you to describe before I'm going to ask you to, to to read a little bit, but before you do that, uh, describe your writing voice. How would you describe that if you were to maybe pick some adjectives out that would mm. define it? Oh man, I know it's not an easy question. No, it's a great question. I just haven't ever thought of that before. Um, you know, in terms of, I think I'm I'm, I'm kind of a a, a natural smartass, um, and I think part of that is is 
that I, I want to talk about. I, I, I wind up thinking about serious things entirely too much because I'm a, I'm a newspaper guy, I think. Um, and those, there are some big questions about who, you know, you know, I covered politics for a long time and, um, you know, what you come, what I have had to face up to <laughs> is that what I thought people were, what we thought people were in a democracy was a lot more rational than people have turned out to be. Oh yeah. And for sure. And that is, you could just leave it there. For me, that means that, um, that some of my assumptions about the better angels, angels of our nature, um, are probably something I have to reconsider. And that's very difficult for me to, to even say. So I think one of the ways that I deal with trying to think about uh, hard questions is to try to think about them with a sense of maybe my voice is a little askew. Maybe it's a little smart ass. Maybe it's, uh, I, you know, humor is important when you're staring down the barrel of something as dark <laughs> as what our future looks like. And I'll just say this about the, the, the series that I'm working on. I think that a lot of science fiction is fairly near term, right? And right now what we're facing is a series of interconnected problems that I just refer to as the 21st century bottleneck because they're all arriving at the same time. Um, overpopulation is kind of driving or the, the overpopulation, I should just say population is driving most of them. Um, and that includes global warming. Um, just the number of people, even if we're not, you know, even if we're not expanding our carbon footprint, when you add new people, you're, um, it's, it just is going to require more energy and we haven't been able to solve that problem. So, um, Meanwhile, the projections are that we're going to start losing global population. It's like, when is it going to get here? Because uh, we're supposed to like top out at nine billion and then uh, start to see the decline. Not, not clear but that it's we're like, going to. Are we going to? Not, are we going to get there or not? I mean, how out. long is this going to take? So, you know, the, the the thing that I've found is I don't want to write that sort of standard apocalyptic fiction, um, dystopian stuff. When you look at what the premise of the Darby cycle is, is that this is a this is a far future world, whether it's Earth or not, I never say. It doesn't matter, right? What what it is, is this is a civilization that's trying to get started again after much more advanced civilizations have come and gone. Not just one, but several. So it's looking back <laughs> instead of looking ahead, which can be just, I think, I, I really like that idea because it lets me um, write about the kinds of problems that a civilization like ours is going to face. Um, from the perspective of people who are trying to look back and understand what that was to where those mm. things are far enough removed that they enter into the realm of myth instead of being so explicit because God, we've all had it with the explicitness of these problems. It's just easier for me to write about it in, in, in a way that, that I feel like without having to be, um, that I can have a little fun with it without it just being that sort of grinding, um, um, sadness when, you know, every time that I see um, something beautiful defiled in the world, it's, it's, it's sad. And I could be yeah. depressed about that, or I could try to find a way to um, be at peace with it and, and bring it, bring something out of it. Yep. No, I get it. I get it. Why don't you go ahead and read a sample from one of your novels? Which one would you uh, pick? And okay. you know, something emblematic of your writing yeah. so that people kind of, it, it's like, hey, if I'm going to read Dan Conover, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to get. Let's see if I like it. Well, let me let me just do this one. This is just, um, this is one from Shane. I'm going to pause and do a Mark Rubio and drink drink a little water first, though. Sure. Go right ahead. Use two hands when you do it. Otherwise, it won't count. Glug, glug, glug. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Um, this is from Shane. This is Shane. I hope, I hope our listeners are politically aware so they know that I just made a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I go, two hands. What are you talking What's about? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, okay, so this is a scene where, where Shane has just run afoul of the, um, of the sheriff in, um, in a place called um, Serdwin. I wasn't out for long, 
But to be honest about it, when you've just been knocked unconscious by a leather truncheon stuffed with damp sand, it isn't the length of time you spend out of your head that matters. Whether you've been down for a few minutes or a few hours, when you open your eyes again, it's not good. Sheriff Cade sat in a stiff back chair with her feet up on a stool. She was flanked by two female guards dressed in standard cotton shirts and trousers, but festooned with those showy red sashes. The male jailer I'd braced for the treatment of Brother Zephyr hovered near the open door to the sheriff's office. So you're the famous Shane Vicker, Cade began, her grin surprisingly wide for such a narrow little figure. Congratulations, you're the first formerly dead person I've ever had to place under arrest. You hit me in the back of the head, I said. Actually, she did, Cade said, pointing to the mannish-looking woman on her right, who smiled and wagged the kosh, the kosh, she'd used on me, a four-inch pouch of braided leather that flopped back and forth at the end of a short wooden handle like some flaccid, malicious penis. I tried to sit up straighter in the chair where I found myself, but the movement came too quickly, and I winced and relented. Why did she hit me in the back of the head? Resisting lawful detention, Kate said, leaning forward and smiling even wider. I just placed you under arrest for contempt, and what did you take and do? Resisted, the big deputy said. The other two underlings in the room nodded in agreement. I'm not a tall, strong woman like you, Shane, Cade said. I'm not particularly smart like they say you are. I'm not truly superlative in any particular way, although I was born into an excellent family. But here's the secret to my success. People don't generally piss down my leg more than once. You get my meaning? No, I said, closing my eyes and trying to make my head stop throbbing. I really don't. I mean that when I tell a person what I'm going to do, I do it. I'm a little woman, Shane. I don't have the luxury of letting people take an inch or here or there. They have to understand that I offer only one warning, not two, not ever. You didn't offer me a warning, I moaned. Marm, when the sheriff says you're under arrest, that constitutes your one warning, said the big guard. You were warned. Everybody in Saradwin knows that, Shane, Kate said. Well, that could be the problem here, I said. See, I'm new in town. Yes, you are, she said taking her feet down off the stool and rearranging herself in the chair. In fact, you're so new to town. You haven't even bothered to figure out how things work around here yet. And I could keep going, but that's, that's about. Which novel is that? That's Shane. The first novel. Oh, that's the title. That's the first that's title. Mm-hmm. It's written in first person. Yep. Do you write everything in first person or not? No, I do not. Um, so Shane, the conceit of Shane is that this is a, a person we don't, Uh, actually say why yet but this is a person of some significance who wrote a famous um a famous memoir that was published in three volumes um and has this is the centennial edition of that um of that memoir that has been just sort of redone for a modern audience by a, a a new generation and so um that lets her have a, uh, a first person voice, but it also helps me with the problem of, um, you know, when you're writing for, if you're actually writing uh, a memoir for an audience of one, like she was, um, you wouldn't necessarily include the proper context that you would need in a fantasy novel. So in this case, I kind of black box that by saying, okay, but we've come through as a, as a, as a, a history department here uh, and we've written in the context that makes it accessible to the modern reader, which was a fun way to write because it gave me the ability to see the world through her eyes. But but what I'm doing now in this second trilogy um, is basically 20 years after the events in Shane um, and the things that, I, that were set in motion in that book um, are now um, something that, that are, I'm – exploring through three novels that can basically stand on their own that tell the story of this slide into war from the perspectives of three very different cultures, three very different um, third person limited protagonists. And um, when I go to the third, the, the third book in the series, or the third uh, trilogy in the series, that's going to be three books where it's got that sort of Michael Shara changing um, POV every chapter, 
which mm. works wonderfully when you're trying to tell a story um, about conflict and, and in that case, in that case, war. Um, well, you also made a, a important point there about it's a trilogy, you know, or you have a few trilogies now, but each of them can stand on their own. In other words, somebody can read it and not feel like I have no idea what's going on. I'm lost. I have no context. Uh, won't be true when you get to book uh, trilogy number three. Um, from trilogy number three on, uh, it will be very difficult to just pick up. But, you know, that's um, I, I think once you get into any any of the longer series, uh, that's going to be a challenge. Um, I'll try to make it as accessible as I can. But um, once you get, you know, 10 books in, um, it's really hard to to get all of that without um, having some sense of it. Now, I try to take uh, one of the things is, you know, I, I, I think <laughs> that I've kind of lucked into a trend that's that's working, which is that, um, you know, I'd already planned to do this as a series. But now that I'm in the indie world, I can see that people who are making a living tend to be people who are writing series and finding an audience um, that wants to be in that world um, is a is a decent business plan if you can find that audience. Yep. Yeah, I get it. Absolutely. Well, genre writing tends to work that way, I think so. you know, yeah. and you've got you've got this ensemble of characters. So this question would be a difficult one for most writers, but I think it's probably going to be easier for you because I want to ask you who your favorite character is. And since you're working with that same set of characters, at least the core mm -hmm. set of characters you've got, who's your favorite character well, I mean, that you've created? I, I'll just say for writing them. <laughs> Um, it's hard to beat your villains, <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know, I think that I'm a, um, generally handicapped by being a person that would like to do the right thing, whatever that thing is. I don't always know. Um, but I would like to do the right thing. Well, that's kind of restrictive. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there's, there's, there's a freedom in a truly amoral villain who thinks in, in, in this case, she's doing the right thing. She's trying to do, you know, what she thinks is best, but she's also lost the thread to the point where she's capable of doing absolutely anything. And, um, you know, at one point, <laughs> at one point in the trilogy near the end, she just loves winning so much that she just, that <laughs> I didn't plan on doing this, but she just breaks into a spontaneous dance <laughs> because it's just <laughs> physically so pleasurable for her to win. And, and I'm like, huh, well, I didn't see that coming. But yeah, she would do that. Now, your wife Janet mm -hmm. is a she's a, uh, a graphic designer, yes. as, uh, among other things. Mm -hmm. So, has she designed your book covers at all? She's designed all of the book covers in the Darbus uh, trilogy, uh -huh. um, and she did. So, if you go, so I've got a, a new cover on the another goddamn novel. Um, which was written as, oh, by the way, I should point out. So um, I've got two novels that you can buy right now uh, on Amazon written by Dan Conover. Uh, I've got three novels on Amazon plus a pre-order that you can buy under the name uh, DC McElroy, which is the name that I created just yeah. to segregate the truly fantasy genre stuff. Um, and that has nothing to do with you know, I'm very transparent about that. It's just the thing where um, Amazon and hopefully I'll, I'll eventually go wide, but a lot of these platforms want to suggest other books by the writer. And you'd like to keep that within something that, that people would who like your series, um, you know, are, are, are going to yes. relate to. So that's the logic yes. there. Yeah. So, um, what about that process of creating a cover? Do you kind of leave that to Janet or do you uh, do you sit and have a skull session and then argue and not talk to each other for a week? And okay. how does that work? So first off, um, Janet is not just my graphic designer and she does the maps, too. Um, she is um, she's a writer and she's gifted. She's got a real voice. The thing that we've and, and I have worked as a graphic designer, um, Janet and I there's a lot of overlap between the things that we do and are, and are interested in. Um, but what's happened over time and particularly since we left Charleston and we moved to the farm is that we've 
come to understand that what I really enjoy is writing and what she really enjoys is, is art, graphic art. So we're specializing now. Um, and I think that's for the better, but how do we do it? Well, um, with the, I'll tell you that with this, with the goddess daughter trilogy, um, it's how do you, there are things that we know about what sells, um, in a genre cover. It's very important. But Janet is not a, is not a, um, she can draw, but she's, that she's not really, that's not really her forte. So she's kind of limited in, in, in that regard. And we looked at a few things, including some 3D modeling software. And, um, you know, she just wasn't happy with any of it. And at one point, we were sitting around the fire pit, um, up at the top of the hill here. And, and I said, you know, um, I just remembered that there's this old, Back in the old days, people used to cut little silhouettes, and they would put those silhouettes in. And they didn't have photography, so they a good silhouette that went into a little pendant or a, a locket was a thing. But then people would also do really elaborate paper cuts, and she's like, "Whoa, I could work with that." So when you look at the at the at the covers, and I'm particularly a fan of the first one, it's basically silhouettes. And backgrounds, and I think it's extremely evocative. <laughs> um, I've had people, um, you know, I, I think at some point, um, I, I just think it's a fantastic look for a fantasy um, series. In that, you know, it's it's not so explicitly drawn that it answers questions for you, but it absolutely uh, evokes a feeling and a place. Um, and it's, they're all very appropriate to the, um, to the series. I, so I, my favorites are the one that, um, she did for Shane. I mean, I like all of them, but, uh, and the one that she's just done for, uh, book number four, which is called Tanupa. Um, and if you get a chance to look at those, what you'll see is that one is in the mountains and it's got one palette and the other is basically set on the plains and a very different palette, um, to, I, but they leave, I think they um, leave people wanting to answer the question, what's going on here? It's what you want. Now, are both of those written under the uh, Conover name? or Both of those are written under D.C. McElroy. Mm -hmm. D.C. McElroy, got it. Okay. So what is your writing regimen? I mean, when do you write? How much do you write? How long does it take you to complete a, a book? Right. So are you familiar with Corey Doctorow? Do you know who that is? Cory Doctorow, E.L. Doctorow. No, no. So Cory Doctorow is a science fiction writer, but he's most famous for uh, being one of the founders of a pretty um, significant uh, early geek blog called Boing Boing. Um, <laughs> okay. Which back in, the, I had a whole incarnation where I was just a kind of a media tech guy uh, and I was a daily reader of Boing Boing. Well, anyway, he was talking about his, his regimen for his fiction. And he's like, you know, what I found is that, you know, I need to give them, I, I need to get about four hours a day. Sometimes I can run over, but you know, if I get in four hours a day, that's, you know, five or six days a week, I'm really making progress. Well, when I was, a um, um, when I was working full time and I worked, you know, I was a 50, 60 hour a week kind of guy at the paper. Um, so writing those first books and the, the short stories that got into the anthologies and won the awards and whatnot, I had to do that uh, and raising four kids. <laughs> Basically, if I wanted to write fiction, I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning um, and do that and then go to work. So my regimen for the first few years was get up at 4.30 in the morning and write until I go to work. Um, and actually, uh, that worked pretty well. But what it is now is I get up in the morning – and I do what I always did as a, as a reporter and editor, which was I read all the news. <laughs> I've, I'm a junkie. I read everything. Um, I, you know, maybe, you know, write about it a little bit on Facebook, which is what I do instead of blogging now. And I make, um, I make us lunch. And then at about noon, I'll start writing. And I find that, um, you know, I write 
at a minimum for four hours. And if it, if I'm on a roll, I just keep rolling. Um, usually we try to knock it off here around five or six. We take the dogs out for a walk. We walk the walk around the, the property here on the farm. Um, and then we just kind of have a life, um, you know, in the evenings, but, um, you know, if, if, if it's moving, um, I'll, you know, right until past midnight. So how long does a book take you to complete generally, if you were to average them out? Right. So, um, yeah, I wrote Tanupa in 46 sessions. I mean, I, I keep track of, I keep track of it on a spreadsheet. Um, took me 46, four hour sessions um, of basically. various section of you know, links. Right. Uh, but 46 days in which I was actually writing on the book. Um, and, you know, the, another goddamn novel, I wrote that in 28 days. Bokur, I wrote in just over a month. Um, Shane took me a long time, uh, relative to everything else because it was the, you know, I kept having to do the brain work for the whole thing, not just the book in front of me. And, and it, um, that was the most complicated of all the heavy lifts, you know. Uh, but then once Shane was written, Lear and Guineer, the, the books two and three in the series, uh, were fast and fun. Um, so I'm, from what I gather, I'm a fast writer. <laughs> um, but... Just saying that, if, are you familiar with the 10,000 hours theory? Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell. Yes, Gladwell. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of, you know, whether, whatever you feel about Gladwell, I think there's a lot of truth about that. And um, um, weirdly enough, the, um, well, I won't tell that story right now, but, but <laughs> um, just I think that writing in public on a daily or weekly basis since I was 25 um, has basically, it, it means that I'm very comfortable writing. I'm less comfortable when I'm not writing. Um, so, you know, like those, those questions, like, you know, um, I enjoy having written, I hate writing. Well, I'm the other way, right? I, I love writing. Uh, I'm not really big on being an author. <laughs> um, that's like a job I would rather be doing the work. So I, it doesn't really surprise me that I'm faster than than some other people. I'm not. Um, I, I think I'm just at this at this point. I'm 58 years old. I've been doing this for a while, and um, it just flows a little more naturally for me now than it did when I was 25. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you about multiverse, because today multiverse can mean virtual reality or augmented right. reality. It can mean um, it can mean spirituality it can have to do with uh, God didn't create one cosmos. There's just an infinite number of cosmos, um, <laughs> cosmoses, however. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then and then there is, of course, physics. And you did say quantum in the title. Yeah. So is it is it physics based? Is it uh, any Absol element of VR? Absolutely. Or is it is it, it is? Okay, no, go ahead. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, oh, no, no. OK. <laughs> so um, remember, I, I talked before about Patricia Anthony, um, the late, great Patricia Anthony. And mm -hmm. she was um, you would get on the phone with her and or. You know, email thread and she would just she's like oh, i'm reading all this stuff about string theory and do you understand quantum so she wrote an entire book called the uh, happy policeman which is about <laughs> aliens that come to earth but their physics that the, you know our physics that we think in <laughs> is newtonian right mm -hmm. there's Correct. quantum well we can't understand forget the language we ha we can't understand the way they think at all it's a very frustrating book to read. And, and I got on the, I got on the phone with her after I read it. I said, Pat, I didn't get this at all. She says, well, that's why it's because they're, they're thinking in quantum physics. And I'm like, okay, I'll go back and read it again. Well, then it made sense. And I, you know, we got back on the phone and I said, well, it's a really good book, but God damn it. I mean, you, you've written something that you're, that's a, that's a heavy lift for people to get when you don't say it explicitly. Uh, so it was kind of a, a running joke with me that, that, if you just kind of wanted to um, 
black box anything in science fiction, you could kind of go, well, it's has to do with string theory or quantum physics. And, um, and of course, that whole idea, I, in, there is this idea in physics, which I, we don't need to get into, but that, that, this, that the multiverse is an existing thing, that, that, there, that there's not just one reality, but lots of them. And, and every time that I've talked to a, a physicist about this sort of thing, and I, and I used to do science writing, um, they're like, oh, God, please don't talk to me. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's you know because the problem is that they're thinking in math, but then to to describe it, they have to do it in analogies, right? So, um, so there's this real problem in science where you we need to be better as science communicators, and we all know it. But oh my God, we have to talk in analogies, and then people get them all wrong. <laughs> so in, in this one, the whole conceit is that um, somehow or another, there's a multiverse, and someone named Dan Conover. A, a, a verge, a quantum version of Dan Conover in another plane of the, the multiverse has broken the multiverse. And now the whole thing is starting to collapse. So mm. all the lines are being crossed. And, um, um, I think it's, I think it's, I, it cracks me up when I read it. Um, but a lot of it too, was that when I was writing that I was coming out of this really frustrating experience of, of having a book get recommended. So I had, a, I wrote the first book uh, is that I wrote was a Darbus book and there's a lot of yada yada, but, but basically the company that had been publishing my short stories um, after this ridiculous delay actually got a hold of it. And, and I get a call from the editor and he says, I love it. I'm recommending that this be published, uh, that we publish this as a, as, as our like third or fourth novel. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, can't wait. Well, then he calls me back in a few days and he says, well, bad news. Uh, so we went into the meeting where I was going to do this and we were introduced to, we were told that the, basically the, everybody had been laid off <laughs> and here's the new uh, publisher and we're only going to do uh, novels out of the Star Wars universe. That lasted, oh, that lasted for three months, and then the company just went out of business. So I'd come out of that going, oh, well, that was kind of close, um, but no no cigar. And then, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, th it's just the frustration of not being part of the literary world and trying to query editors and publishers, you know, really more agents after a while. And it was just, I couldn't crack it. And so I was looking at um, doing a, a, an ebook version and self-publishing the books that I already had in my catalog. Cause you know, what's the point of having something that you've written that no one else ever gets to read? Um, right. I wanted to get it out there. And, but just the experience of, of reading all the advice that people had for, for ebook publishers back in 2012, 2013, um, I just thought it was ridiculous and it cracked me up. And so I, th I thought, well, I'm going to write this this book that's going to um, have me in all these absurd situations um, and with interludes where I just talk about marketing. And that's that's the book <laughs> um, mm. uh, with these little author interludes that, um, you know, bring in bring back characters from short stories and things that I've, I've written and in, in, one in particular in this new way and um, just gets silly. And I really like that about that book. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about life on the farm. Mm. You're a, a black sheep, black sheep manor yeah. gardens, right? Yeah. Um, what, what kind of farming do you guys do? Well, I, I always hesitate to call it farming because um, for all sorts of reasons, largely related to scale and the fact that I refuse to go into debt. <laughs> um, but, Anyway, we, this was a, this was Janet's great grandfather's farm. It's up here in the South Carolina upstate in the, in the Appalachian foothills, spent a lot of time in, in the Appalachians. I'm very comfortable here. Um, but there was no one actually living here. Her family owns this property in a trust. So Janet is a co-owner with her sisters and her father and her father spends He's in his 80s, and he, he likes to spend as much time up here as he can. He has his own place. But there was a – it just so happened that there was a you know building here that was not – or a trailer here that was not being um, – had nobody in it. 
and um, I'd just gotten laid off from this really good gig of uh, doing uh, marketing and commo for uh, the Charleston Battery uh, soccer team in, in Charleston, South Carolina, a great club. Um, we had a lot of success with it. We grew the, um, you know, we broke the record for um, single season attendance and all kinds of stuff and made, made them kind of cool. And it made them cool enough that a tech bro came in and bought it and ran it straight into the ground and laid everybody off. Oh. <laughs> um, so I got laid off um, right you know, right at, in April. And so basically there was in, in April, 2016. So there was, there were no jobs to be had in U S soccer because, you know, the season had just started. Everybody was fully staffed up. And so we were just looking at each other. We had a, we had our business Arctopia, which is a media serv- We still have it. It's a media services business. And we had, you know, um, not enough clients at that point to pay the, the mortgage and all the things with, you know, the the kids and, um, without that soccer income. So I'm like looking around at what to do. And at one point, Janet said, you know, we could do this. We could move up to, uh, we could move up to the upstate. Uh, we could live on the farm. We could cut our costs and we could do the things that we always wanted to do. Kids are out now. Um, we could sell our house and we could try writing and make an art. And I'm like, let's do that. Um, And what? Grow food? Well, grow flowers? So so originally the cattle on the property. The the, our original plan was that um, we would we would try whatever kind of agricultural thing fit into you know we've learned, and so we spent the first few months just kind of sorting that out. And we built our first garden uh, in 2017. That was just for us. It did very well. Um, so in 2018, we um, we made a garden to be a commercial garden for the first time, and um, expanded. Um, started thinking about it as a business, and started going to the farmers market. And the the goal was to um, make enough. The first goal was to make enough money to cover the cost of um, all of our expenses for the, all the gardening that we did. Weren't really concerned that first year with, um, with making a profit. And, you know, we got there. And so we got bigger the next year. And um, the biggest year was the year that wound up being the start of the pandemic. And that killed the farmer's market. So here I am with all the produce in the world and no good way to sell it. And you might think, well, just go to the, go to the grocery store, man. It's not that simple. <laughs> so yeah. I had, I had a couple of, um, I had a couple of places where I could sell produce. I, um, and we also, you know, because, um, we grew, we grew a lot of things looking for what, people would like and what people really liked (laughs) was our tomatoes we grow fantastic tomatoes here and um so we had a few these are heirloom tomatoes the kind mostly fully genetically replete we grow different kinds but the vast majority of what we grew would be considered heirlooms um and they're delicious it's also there's a reason there there's a reason why the that's a bad business (laughs) which i can go into um, but it's a very, that's a difficult business because, you know, generally, a, a, if you love an heirloom tomato, um, it, the moment that it is good, uh, that it is perfect is a short moment <laughs> and people are used to, Americans are used to buying tomatoes and setting them on the counter and letting them sit there for a week. You, if you do that with an heirloom, you've got a mushy tomato. Mm. So, um, so you buy them daily, uh, you, just like the Europeans, you go to, like the, Europeans. to the store daily That's it. and you, and you put it right to use. That's right. Otherwise, so we, otherwise it's expired. So we still have people, we still have people during, uh, during tomato season who just show up here. Uh, even though we stopped being after the, 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 the farmer's market crashed, um, I decided I, I'm not doing this again. So, um, this, this past year, uh, sec- year two of the um, pandemic, really, um, I 
only grew for us, which meant only, you know, on tomatoes, instead of 350 plants, um, 350 vines, we maybe had 110. And this year, I'll, it'll probably be a little less than that. I'm trying to um, find that right um, thing for two people. And, you know, we, um, we try to share the stuff around. Um, now, my, now our focus is much more on um, food that we can uh, preserve. Last year, we uh, preserved... As in canning them yeah, and bottling them? Yeah. So last yeah. year, we preserved okay. 64 gallons of, of uh, marinara. <laughs> mm, nice. That's a lot of marinara when you can... Yeah. It. And, 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 and not insignificant. Well, you're talking to a guy who eats a lot of pasta. So. <laughs> and let me tell you what, when, you are, when you're growing your own paste tomatoes and then you're mixing heirlooms into that... Oh, I can imagine. Oh, it's really good. Um, and then put some chili pepper in there or some Calabrian peppers and really light uh, it up. Well, the other thing that we've found is that, I mean, I've, I've always kind of enjoyed growing, um, you know, peppers. But the thing about growing hot peppers of various kinds and chili peppers is that you can make fantastic sauce out of that. And that's a great way to save them. So, um, you know, unlike a green pepper, which its use is when it's ripe. Uh, when you grow chili peppers and um, various hot peppers, um, they have lots of uses that last for years. Mm. So those are our kind of specialties. But mostly, I just like having gotcha. I like having greens available to us. Um, you know, twelve months out of the year, and um, grow a lot of potatoes. Self sufficiency camping equipment, a farm. Yeah, uh, you know a. a- Kerosene lantern and a quill <laughs> with some ink. Yeah, yeah. And you're all set. Gentleman farmer is not the right word, uh, but <laughs> but in, well, why not? I mean, you do for it, pleasure. Well, maybe you don't do it for pleasure. You do it for subsistence. Uh, yeah, it's both. And and the but right now, um, you know, that, or you're just not a gentleman. You're I'm not, not really a gentleman. gentleman. I'm not a gentleman. Right you, now, you swear like a sailor or a tank commander. Uh, yeah, so. absolutely. It's my native <laughs> voice, but. The, but anyway, my, my, the, we, what we've been through, and I, we're still going through it, is this whole sort of, de, you know, decluttering not just your life, but your head. Getting out of all the things that, you know. I, it's called deprogramming. Yeah. That's, Once you leave a cult, you have to be that's, deprogrammed. That's right. There's a lot of people in this country need to be deprogrammed <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, it's been. I, it's been wonderful, and it's and I gotta say that um, that for writing, if if you know, you know, for people who are writing, it, if you can get to a place that might not have the luxuries that that you're used to or the the material standard that you're used to, if what you're really about <laughs> is finding time to do the thing that you love, that you can't not do, man, the best thing you can do is just reduce your expenses to the point where you don't have to work very much to meet expenses and yeah zen type living mm-hmm. minimalism mm-hmm. minimalism i read read a blog post years ago by a woman who it was called 101 things she got rid of everything but 101 things that really meant something to her mm-hmm. and she said she was so much happier yes. to just get rid of that uh, you know just basically purge and not you know there, there are people who i just did a cover profile in the magazine i'm editor mm-hmm. of and the guy, he's CEO of a company. He's an entrepreneur. He started multiple companies, very successful. He says, owning things just gives me anxiety. Yeah. It's just, I, I would rather not own this stuff. I, all I need is, you know, my home, my family, some food mm-hmm. and yada, yada. Um, this would be a good point to end on because we're running long and I don't want to start acting like Joe Rogan here and go for <laughs> two and a half hours and smoke a joint and all that oh, stuff to, to propel us. Okay. So, our guest has been Dan Conover, who also writes on the name D.C. McElroy or McElroy, McElroy, depending on how you like to pronounce it. You like it, McElroy. There it is. D.C. McElroy. Thanks a million for taking time and coming on the program. And you've really been generous with your perspectives. And I was saying at the top, you've got that. you got a great voice for this. you got that sugar cured tobacco <laughs> voice. It must come from living in North Carolina. You did say you were a smoker at one point, but fortunately, you gave that up. But uh, you got some good residual uh, auditory command out of that. Well, good. Thanks for coming on I the program. A lot of fun. Thank you very much for having me on.